The bearded gentleman on my left <laughs> is my good friend Katine. Katine, welcome back to Canada. Thank you, thank you. Fun to have you here again. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Many of you will recognize him. Uh, some of you won't. And so for those of you who don't recognize this uh, uniquely visaged uh, individual, uh, Katine is, let me see if I can go through all of the uh, accolades, ex-editor or ex-contributing editor to Photo Techniques magazine, currently a contributing editor to Mike Johnson's The Online Photographer, uh, a website which doesn't needs little introduction and if you haven't visited please do so it's wonderful and uh, what else uh, Kodak called you uh, one of the world's greatest color printers or yep. some some accolade um, like that author of uh, post exposure pro what, what Arthur Kramer called the last great darkroom book right uh, I author a book on on digital photo restoration that's uh that's enough but you also in, uh, in your spare time you're a scientist you're uh, uh, and you were one of the uh, great dye transfer printers uh, a dying breed uh, mm -hmm. what were you were telling me over lunch today that you think there is just one left in North America one that I know of for sure in North America doing it at least for other people I know the couple of people who are doing it privately for themselves okay but really, Jim Browning is in Vermont is the only person I know of in North America who's still printing for anybody else. And uh, let's see, there's Andy Cross in Australia, and uh, Bettina and Egbert in Germany. <laughs> and I think that's it for the whole for planet. For the whole planet. Out of, the, out of six billion about people, about a half a dozen. <laughs> but what's amazing is, is that there's anybody left seeing that Kodak killed off the process 20 years ago. Right. You know, now, this is when you couldn't drive a stake <laughs> through its heart. You went through your last dye transfer materials uh, just earlier this year, 2013, uh, doing a uh, print sale through the online photographer website. Yes. And that went very well, I understand. It went extremely well. There, there was a method behind that madness. I've been doing dye transfer for 40 years. Honestly, my muse is bored. <laughs> it's, it's become a routine. Right. Currently, what I find far more exciting is digital printing. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new world for me to explore. There are new techniques there that I'm constantly learning, and it's much more interesting to me. So I was looking for an excuse to get out of the dark room. So the idea was, let's have this final blowout sale on the <laughs> online photographer. We'll peg the number of prints we offer to the amount of large paper I have available, mm -hmm. with a safety margin. So if the sale goes well, this will just wipe out my supply of dye transfer paper and we'll declare that's done. I, I don't mean there isn't other paper out there in the world that people have squirreled away, but I'm not going to go hunting for it. It's uh, what you had and what we saw in your freezers 10 years ago Precisely. when we interviewed you uh, at your home and your studio uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Right. So this was using up the paper part. I, I did end up with extra matrix film at the end, an extra dye, but the paper, which is the third component, I uh, ended up with four extra sheets when all was said and done, <laughs> cutting it a little finer than little I would fine. have liked. Now, but, but we did 160 prints. We sold 160 prints. I just finished getting them all printed and finished and spotted and shipped. And I'm now in recovery mode. This is midsummer now of 2013. It's, it's midsummer now, yes, f five months after I started the insanity. Oh, okay. So if I appear a little spacier than I did in the interview <laughs> of 10 years ago, no, that's not old age or anything setting in. It's <laughs> sheer exhaustion. Now, when we interviewed you 10 years ago, uh, those of you who may be unfamiliar, it's issue 11 of the Luminous Landscape Video mm -hmm. Journal. And we not only talked about your career and photography, but we did what I have been told is probably the most thorough documentary done on dye transfer printing in your studio. It's, I'm told that there do exist other movies of people doing dye transfer. I've never seen any of them. If it was, it was done many, many years ago, and just given the motion picture technology, it couldn't possibly have been on the same level. Okay, well. So and, I'm saying, you know, this to me is the definitive move, you know, moving picture record. Okay. <laughs> definitive <laughs> moving picture record of what dye transfer printing looks like in the darkroom. Uh, 
you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, the uh, Chris, cre credit, credit grows to Chris. I meant you for both of you. <laughs> did, a, did a wonderful job of producing a record of what the process actually looks like from one end to the other. Um, and people watch it very carefully mm -hmm. because I've occasionally gotten a couple of critical questions from readers just because of the exigencies of doing filmmaking, we took a few shortcuts in the process of filming it. <laughs> you know, faked a few things that we didn't think viewers would notice. Well, they notice these things. <laughs> you know, like, do you really put the negative in the carrier without taking it out of the sleeve? <laughs> Honestly, I got a question about this. No, no, no. It was done for the sake of the movie to move things along. Things, little things like that. Right. But it's nice. It means they really paid attention. You know, I, I, it tells me they're very much watching this. They're trying to learn from what we're doing. And I consider it a compliment when a question like that comes in. That they're not taking your work casually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are, 2013. That was around 2003. It was just a little under 10 years ago. A little under 10 years ago. And in 2003, we were well into the digital revolution. Um, now we're a decade later, and even Katyn, the last of the die transfer printers... Almost. Well, all right, a little poetic license here. Uh, you're shooting uh, Micro Four Thirds. Uh, you're printing with an Epson printer. Uh, and I think the question... The chronology the there is interesting. <laughs> uh, no, really it is, because we talked some about that there. I remember in the uh, video interview, which of course everyone will now go back and watch again. We talked about the die transfer and then we talked about the future of printing and where it was going, which of course I was very bullish on digital but had not moved into it yet. Well, within the next year, I started doing digital printing. The Epson 2200 came along and for me, that crossed my threshold into good enough. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not saying there weren't before, but for me, this was the right printer. And I started working on that and worked up a portfolio of my work, which had previously been in die transfer on the Epson printer. By 2005, I was heavily into digital printing. 2006, I bought my first digital camera. I didn't know it at the time, but April 2007, I made my last film photograph. At that time, I didn't know it was the last That's film photograph. That's why Kodak went bankrupt. It's my fault. <laughs> my fault. The whole world follows my lead. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a trendsetter. <laughs> but April 2007, I made what turned out to be my last film photograph. Not, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was more like whenever I wanted to pick up a camera, the same way back in the film days, you'd say, do I want to go out and do black and white or color mm -hmm. photography? Well, it was like, do I want to do film or digital? And I was just always picking up the digital. And that state of affairs lasted for Mm, three years. And in 2010, I woke up one morning in February and said, no, I haven't stopped doing film. I've quit film. It's a different mental state. There's mm -hmm. stopping means you might go back. Quit means you just, you know you're never going to go back. <laughs> and within a month, I'd sold all my film gear mm -hmm. and was working purely digitally. I'd stopped making chromogenic prints in the darkroom several years earlier because the digital was so much nicer. And now, finally, I'm getting ready to close down my dark room. Uh, That's a historic uh, a moment. Historic I, event. Yes, I remember the black very plastic well. will go away. <laughs> I re That's right. I remember your black plastic dark room. The temporary black plastic dark room. <laughs> Which lasted for how many years? <laughs> 28 years. <laughs> right. Well, that's temporary. Yeah, temporary. Some the, the one I threw up quickly when I moved in so I'd have a place to work. Right. And knock on wood, within the next four to six weeks, Black plastic's going to come down, or at least the, the shades will come off the windows, and light will once again <laughs> enter the space from the outside. When I started writing about digital, and I became an early adopter of yes. digital, mm -hmm. 95, 96, I bought uh, a Nikon uh, 1000 film scanner, and then uh, I guess it was 2001 when the first the Canon D30 uh, came out, or was it 30D? I don't know, Canon's always changing the letter number orientation. I think it was the D30. It's also memorable. Right, <laughs> really. <laughs> At least they weren't using X's. Right. Now everything has an X in it. Um, but I remember saying a, word, a phrase that you just uh, picked up, good enough. 
<laughs> I realized that that little three megapixel camera, or was it six, it doesn't matter, was good enough. And in some ways, even back then, uh, really put up a challenge. There weren't enough megapixels, but it put up a challenge to film in terms of uh, color purity, tonal smoothness of tonalities. The smoothness of tonality was the big thing. Mm -hmm. Roger Hicks and I cued into that one early on. We, we'd spent a lot of time discussing film quality and how it works, uh, you know, just what makes a good looking photograph. And when digital came along and we could start to do the comparisons, we realized the thing that set medium and large format apart was not the sharpness, no. it was the tonality. It was the grain going away, the feeling that you could just fall into the colors, the, the liquid quality of mm -hmm. the tones, and that's what made w large format special. And the neat thing about digital is it got that very quickly. Even with lower resolutions. It's not about resolution. It's not about resolution. You, know, you can take a picture of a blue sky, and all mm -hmm. you need if it's a blank blue sky is one pixel. <laughs> but, you know, but if it... Well, and just repeat it many times. Yeah, it's not about the resolution. <laughs> no. You know, 100 pixels will do it for blue sky. And as long as they all look the same, mm -hmm. you get this large format tonality. And that turns out to be far more important to the quality most of the time. I mean, there are a few photographers out there who really exploited the resolution you could get out of large format. And but, but the majority of them, it was about the beauty oh. of the tone and the color. And digital got you there very fast. And some people still argue uh, and they, these are people who never shot large format film, mm -hmm. but they think it's impossible when we say, well, an 8x10 contact print l had a look mm -hmm. that was just... Ineffable. Ineffable. That's the word I was looking for. And it had nothing to do with resolution. Yeah. And that's one of the things that digital has given us. No intelligent person anymore who has experience argues against digital. Well, I mean, there may be some. Uh, I just have, I have no truck with them. <laughs> you know, Me it's, it's just not worth discussing. And I don't want to get on that, uh, on that bandwagon uh, right now. But what I want to do is focus instead and, on... And, you know, just to make it clear, we're not dissing people who like film. There's no, nothing not wrong with liking film. Zero wrong with liking it, film, zero wrong with printing in the in the chemical darkroom. Zero, it's all zero cool. wrong with staying with black and white printing in the darkroom or even dye transfer. It, we're talking about what we like to do. Exactly. And we're talking about the people who say there's an objective reason for choosing one over the other. No, at this point, it's all about your personal aesthetics. Well put. Now we don't need to continue this conversation. Okay, said we're it done. All. This will be a short segment, people. But <laughs> no, it's um, the rest of it will be filled with, <laughs> with feature animated cartoon. <laughs> you were showing me some of your recent prints, mm -hmm. and I was looking at them. And one of the things that struck me is you are one of the few uh, photographer printers I know who is not only willing, but incredibly skilled at exploring the quarter tones, the dark areas of the image. Yeah. What I want to touch on is this incredible ability that you have now with digital to explore the dark side, <laughs> if you will, the, qu the quarter tones, the dark areas of the image. And everyone is struggling to, uh, you know, print up in the highlights and ke keep detail in the highlights. You're doing it in the quarter tones. And what I wanted to ask you is, you were a master of it in the dye transfer world. Uh, and I believe it's fair to say that the dye transfer process excelled in that area. Better than anything else. So how does a typical Epson inkjet print compare in its ability to uh, convey information in, in the dark tones? Well, just to put it in perspective, nothing compares to dye transfer that way. Dye transfer simply got you the longest density range in a print of any known printing process. How many stops was it, do you think? <sighs> it ranged between a density, depending on how you were contrast doing, density range was between 2.7 and 3.0. 
useful range in a print. That's nine to ten stops of range mm -hmm. in the print. It was like having a slide on paper. Right. And you couldn't see it all there unless you just bombed light on it like mad. But you knew it was there unconsciously. If you looked into a shadow, it never blocked up on you. There was still that perception that if you looked even deeper, you'd see even more, and there was. And that's something every other process is handicapped with, and the digital processes are. Uh, they're about we can see them on screen. You can see them on screen, but you can't see them in the print. You can't get the print density up there yet. The same it's same with the conventional darkroom print. I mean, we're not talking any different from a silver gelatin print or chromogenic. Dye transfer was just special this way. But what I can do with the digital prints to make up for that is I can do better tone separation in the shadows. I can manipulate the curve structure. So I can artificially kick up the separation between the almost blacks and the almost almost blacks. So it renders better. And I can make up for a lot of that. So My feeling is there's no question that a lot of the stuff I'm printing digitally now, I will be able to make much better prints of in 10 years. But as you said, good enough. I'm OK now. So in, in terms that the old farts, uh, some of you out there, those of us like you and me, uh, who remember the zone system, mm -hmm. who understand the zone system, um, where where's the cutoff? Is it around zone three? Oh, or? we're below that. We're go we're going really with the exposure range of even your average. I'm not talking camera. cameras. I'm talking prints. I know, but. They aren't really separable in the zone system. You're really talking zone one. Okay. You know, you're talking between, you can usably work between zone zero and zone one, okay. and absolutely between zone one and zone two, because you can amplify the difference enough artificially so that when it's printed, it comes out looking good. The, but I, I can illustrate. The problem in the darkroom is all darkroom materials have a characteristic curve that looks like this starts off a very low mm -hmm. contrast in the shadows, reasonably contrasting in the midtones, and then very low contrast in the highlights again. And it's hard for us to see stuff in the shadows to begin with. We don't have good visual separation. So you've got a double fight there in the dark room. Even in dye transfer, which takes it down much further, you've got low contrast shadows and low contrast vision. They're working against each other. And with the digital process, you can artificially go in and kick up that curve to compensate a lot. So you can bring up the separation. It doesn't look artificially after you. Print. All right, but so if you're saying that we have separation between zero, one, and two, mm -hmm. which you are doing by putting a kick in the curve at the low end, something's got to give, because our prints don't have ten stops of dynamic range. No, uh, you lose a little bit of contrast in the midtones and the highlights. Exactly, you're always reapportioning. Um, and, and this is again why I thought that was a political thing, reapportionment. Well, it is, but it, it, it's an unpleasant <laughs> process all around, but a, but a necessary one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you sacrifice a little bit. Uh, to, for me to get print here, which I'll show you, where we're pulling enough stuff out of the shadows, so I can get the separation in the dark snow. And as we discussed, probably I'm I'm, a tr I'm probably allocating between ten and fifteen percent of the tonal range to that very, very dark area, which means everything else I'm losing a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's going a little flatter. And that's part of the artistic compromise. And you can think of it the other way. When you, when you tried to print, even in the darkroom, tried to print scenes with wonderful specular highlights, like mm -hmm. water with glistening sun glints or snow, and you had to print way down to get them to separate from the diffuse white, and everything else had to go darker. And this is still easier digital. I mean, you talked about the dark end of the scale, but honestly, the big improvement is at the at the light end of the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and by highlights, because in digital, that's where the data is. No, it's not about it's where the data is. It's where it's hard to control and where you see it very clearly. Um, this whole business about where the data is—that's total crap. We don't okay. see data; we see information, and no. they are not the same thing. All right. More data is not the same as more information. Any time you alter the photo f for output, you are sacrificing data. So does that really mean the photograph looks ba better in the native f color you know, format of the sensor in the camera, with no contrast, with no tonal adjustments? Because any time you make an adjustment, you are throwing away data. I think we have a, a semantic okay. issue here. 
the data, if you will, and I'll stick with data, okay. not information. Okay. All right. The number of bits. Number of bits. There are more bits in the highlights than there are in the shadows. And therefore, when you try and open up the shadows, you don't have as much information. But there's still more than enough. That's an interesting point, and I know I won't, I won't disagree, yep. but more than enough is a uh, quantitative argument, and I think that having more than enough is better than having more than enough. I got what you mean. You get what I mean? I get what you mean. <laughs> and, and by more than enough, I mean when I work with it when I produce a print from it, there is nothing visible in the print that says that there's a paucity of data. No, but if you were trying to um, do the same kind of, you know, pull the putty apart up in the highlights, you could do more. You could do more of that. That's that's all I'm, that's the point I'm making. No, it is. Um, Got away with that one. Yeah, no. (laughs) It, it is. Um, sorry. Never it's, argue with Dr. Science. Well, it's also a bit of a hot button with <laughs> mm-hmm. me because I do run into people who will say one th- thing or another about it, which boils down to, but you're sacrificing data. And I'm using these in the colloquial sense. No doubt there are some information scientists who are going to watch this video <laughs> who are going to go crazy with the way I'm using the word information. But by that I mean you know, informa- information is stuff that means something to us. Mm-hmm. Data is just recorded numbers. and. Photographs aren't about data. They're about information. Fair enough. And most of the people who argue about preserving data are getting the information wrong. They're actually doing things which get them less or bad information in return for more data. Ooh, uh, that's heavy. I've got to think about that. Mm. Okay, go on. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's all compromises. It's all trade-offs. Well, that's what photography it is. is. What I started to say about the highlights, though, being the special area is, there our vision's very sensitive. We're very good for, it's why we get so fussy about the color of paper bases, things like this. These mm-hmm. are a few points of difference. You can't see a few points of difference in the shadows. No. You can't see the exact color. You can't tell what its hue is. In the highlights, you're exquisitely sensitive to it. And in conventional darkroom work, it has the same problem. It's got this roll off in the highlight curve, so it goes very nonlinear, and it's also very hard to manipulate. Mm -hmm. It's it's not an area you can change very much in darkroom processes. And what it means is you're kind of stuck with whatever the material hands you. The classic example being good luck photographing, you know, surf with sunlight glinting off it and printing it in the darkroom so that it sparkles. Well, printing it anywhere so it sparkles, but especially in the darkroom. In the digital world, you have control over those curve shapes. You've got control over all three color channel curve shapes. You can linear, linearize what you need to. If you need to put just a little kick in it to make the highlights sparkle, you can do it. It's all under your control, and it's all stuff we are very sensitive to visually. And that's the area where digital shines to begin with. Mm-hmm. One of the things I found when I started printing digital, like I said, I took a portfolio of mine of Scotland that existed in dye transfer and attempted to reproduce it digitally. And I found that about, to my surprise, even with 2004 technology, and at that point my much more primitive printing skills, about half the photographs looked as good as digital prints as they did as dye transfer. Um, Don't ask me to define what as good as means. What it means is I'm the artist and I look at and if it makes me as happy, it's as good. That's what it means. <laughs> Half of them were as good. They were different, mm-hmm. but they were as good. They satisfied me as much. Two thirds of them were definitely not as good as the dye transfer print, and those were most particularly the ones that depended on those shadows that just went on forever. The other, thir- the other remaining one sixth were better as digital prints, and they were ones that depended on the highlights for their impact. Mm-hmm. And there, there was no question that the digital print was superior. That's because there was more data. (laughs) Than in the (laughs) darkroom? What it really was is because I now had exquisite control over exactly how it got rendered. Uh, That didn't just affect normal white highlights. Um, A light color, like like the brilliant green we have between us, that's that's really a highlight color because there's almost no magenta in it. Mm -hmm. If If you look at the green channel in a digital photograph of that, 
it's all going to be up above 225. It's going to be pegging near white. So things like even separating greens and foliage, you got much more precise color separation in digital. You could control it. And this is where the digital started to become superior to the dye transfer for me. You know, now at this point, I consider it six of one, half a dozen of another. It's not that I can't make lovely dye transfer prints in the dark room. I just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, understood. Um, let's, let's switch gears. Sure. We were out shooting earlier today. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a lot of fun, and then uh, we had some good, uh, was it Tibetan food? Mm-hmm, Tibetan. Yeah, Tibetan, in a little town in Peterborough, Ontario. It was really good. Yeah, I've had worse days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but what was interesting is um, you were shooting with what I know is your now preferred camera system, mm -hmm. which is a Micro Four Thirds. Yeah. It's an Olympus. You've got a couple of Olympus cameras. Uh, and I was shooting with my Fuji X Pro One, uh, which is not that for much most different. shooting not that much different. And that's my favorite camera. And maybe it's because both of us like to be a little less encumbered uh, rather than schlepping around. I know you used to shoot Pentax Six Seven. Uh, I've been shooting medium format. Uh, shot large. I shot four by five sheet film. Um, there's something very liberating about moving around with small, light cameras and smaller, lighter lenses. Yeah. You know, this is a big deal. And this is something that, for instance, the Leica rangefinder folks had been saying for years and years. This is not new. But then I would have been stuck with this little bitty piece of film, <laughs> and it wasn't big enough. And now that form factor has gotten divorced from the issue. Well, that's, that's, a very, that's what, the interesting thing. What it means point. is I can do the equivalent of carrying along around the ultralight like a kit that's always with me and convenient to use and I don't have to schlep and I'm getting medium format I, I guess I, I guess <laughs> so that really Best now both worlds. that begs the question and it's a question that photographers debate ad nauseum mm -hmm. and that is was Godzilla right is bigger better oh absolutely <laughs> but when is good enough good enough? Bingo. <laughs> uh, the, the way I try to describe it to photographers who bring that up, you know, when they say, but full frame is better, or medium format is better, or when they're still around, you know, digital back for 4x5 is better, is, but that was true in the film era. Most professional photographers settled on 35 millimeter film. Some of us, a minority, a very small minority, decided medium format was enough. An even smaller group, minuscule group, needed to go to 4x5 and 8x10. We all picked our ranges, but nobody said the people doing 35 were doing lousy work. And for the majority of professional photographers, that was good enough. So is bigger better? Yeah, bigger is still better. Mm -hmm. Godzilla was right. Godzilla was right, but Godzilla is also a bit of a pain to deal with. <laughs> Doesn't play well with others, destroys Tokyo, you know. It's like, so, we'll not share with the class. <laughs> Bottom line, you'd think we'd been drinking. <laughs> uh, Bottom line, water, honestly, water. Yes, that's not vodka. <laughs> I can vouch for it. Um, I guess, I guess at the bottom of uh, the line, as it were, or the line that's at the bottom, um, Micro Four Thirds. I think it's the sweet Good spot. Good enough. I think it's the sweet spot now. Uh, or for those who care, APC. APSC. APSC. They're really the, not enough different in size yeah. to matter. Um, it's a quibble, but something in that range. The, you know, vaguely half to two thirds, thirty-five millimeter size seems to be the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. The quality is at the medium format or better. And that's a hard thing to quantify. All I know is I can compare my right, you can 17, make... I can compare my 17 by 22 inch Epson prints right. to my 16 by 20 die transfers. It's close enough. Right. And I go, yeah, it's at least as good or better. When I show them to other people and look and say, does this you know, look like medium format quality to you? They go, hell yeah. And it gets you there. And there doesn't seem to be much need to go a lot smaller than that. I think for the same reason that sub-35 millimeter formats never ca caught on. 
which well, is which is you're in a range of diminishing returns. A camera with a significantly smaller sensor than micro four thirds doesn't become a significantly other than the pocketable ones, mm -hmm. but as a system doesn't become a significantly smaller camera. Right. So I think you hit the and for many people that's actually a disadvantage. It, as with the old, for instance, Olympus. OMDs, a lot of people complain this camera's too small for them to handle. Mm -hmm. I, I have pretty small and delicate hands. Yeah, it's so fine for I. me. Yeah. But I know a lot of people who need a bigger camera. So for I, me, think, we, what I, I think we have it up as a sweet spot. You know, the British have a saying, horses for courses. Exactly. And uh, for me, I've got several camera bags. I use mm -hmm. a lot of gear because I teach different sure. things and write about different things. But this morning, when it was, okay, going out shooting with Katine, we're going to go to the country, and then we're going to shoot uh, an interview. What camera do I want to take? There was no question. It was, you know, the, the Fuji, but it could have been an Olympus or a Panasonic or, you know, something. Was I going to take my medium format gear? No. Was I going to even take my Nikon full frame? Nah, overkill. You know, there are times and places, mm -hmm. but if, if, you, if one has a choice, then great, have those choices. But I really think that this is interesting, and yet we are at a period of time now in the summer of 2013 where within the last couple of weeks I have read an amazing number of doom and gloom articles about the state of um, uh, the, the so-called mirrorless uh, cameras. Really? And that in the United States they are selling extremely badly uh, Nikon is giving some serious thought to the future of its one series uh, cameras. Sales, Olympus sales suck. Uh, Panasonic sales suck. Uh, and is it's different in Japan. Is anything not sucking in sales? DSLRs. Really? DSLRs are selling well. I would never have guessed. Compact system cameras, so-called mirrorless cameras, are selling poorly. Now, this is North America, to oh, no. a lesser extent Europe. In Japan, they're doing really well. No. But then there's a little ego problem there, is they're perceived as girly cameras. They're smaller and lighter. Right. Well, well, as we've discussed in private <laughs> conversations, the world market is a very different thing. There, yeah. you know, there, there are some cameras that out there that even the companies that made them thought weren't going to be very successful because they went by the North American slash European market, and it turned out other sectors in the world, which surprisingly enough have billions of people more, <laughs> just fell in love with them. So I don't gauge it as a state of the total industry. In fact, I've pretty much given up trying to do that because really. I can't think outside North America. I can barely think European. So if someone asks me, is this camera <laughs> going to be a success? I look at it and go, I don't know. Ask the burgeoning middle class in India or China. Mm -hmm. Ask the Japanese. Maybe they'll have a better idea. Mm -hmm. But I'm very intrigued to hear that the mirrorless systems are not, not turning out to Not be doing thing. well in North America. Not dead yet. Not dead yet. But. Uh, you mean not like showing the kind of growth that I think the manufacturers would like to see. And in part, I blame the manufacturers. Um, I don't know when people will be viewing this, uh, and maybe I'll be proved wrong, but I think one of the biggest problems in the camera industry is the Japanese manufacturers are, how shall I put this? They give us the minimum they have to mm. in any particular new model. They lack balls. They lack aggressiveness. And I'll look, give you an example from the video industry. There are companies like RED with their video cameras who five, six years ago came out with RED and they blew away Sony, Panasonic, Aeroflex. Now, a lot of these companies, Panasonic not. Panasonic just gave up the ghost in, in high-end uh, video cameras. But Sony has fought back. Uh, Aeroflex has fought back. But RED came along and, you know, probably half the major motion pictures shot in Hollywood now are being shot on RED cameras. Recently, Blackmagic, a small Australian peripheral equipment manufacturer has brought out a series of video cameras that are absolutely knocking the socks 
off the traditional Japanese camera makers in features, in price, in ballsiness. You know, raw, raw video for a thousand dollars. You know, whereas nothing from Canon or Nikon can give you raw video for under fifteen thousand dollars. So th these are the kinds of things that are going on, and, and, and I. Uh, don't want to bite the hand that feeds because I have good relations yeah. with a lot of these camera makers. Uh, but I have to say, they are driven by um, the good enough syndrome. You know, speaking of which, yeah. you know, let's not throw all the coolest technology that we can come up with into our new products. Let's hold back. And we'll just we'll give them this, and then we'll give them that. And next year we'll give them this other thing. If that's really what they're doing, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Yeah. Because um, back to the good enough thing. One thing that's very clear in the digital camera business is the gold rush is over. The boom times are over. Uh, when the company, the electronics company, started to push the transition which not coincidentally was right after the dot bomb and they badly needed a new market. They were, they were very aggressive and in a span of less than a half dozen years, it was almost a complete turnover from film to digital. Mm -hmm. And the cameras started off, as you said, they were okay, they were adequate, but clearly more was better. Well, it very quickly got to the point where they were more than adequate, they were more than good enough. And now even a remarkably cheap digital camera is better than the cheap film camera you would have gotten in 2000. So why buy a new one? There, previously, you could sell people on the new models. Previously, they were happy to upgrade to a new model because there was a tangible improvement in quality they got with it. Now, why trade in my camera next year for a new one or even in two years or even three? These pictures look good enough. And that's just inherent in a maturing industry. I mean, you're sort of stuck with that, but it means the boom is over. And I don't think they can get away with doing the, well, this year's model has slightly bigger tail fin approach. Well, one, one, one has big enough tail fins already. One, one marketing manager for one of the major mm -hmm. companies, a few years ago, I said, so what's coming up for you know the coming year? And he said, oh, bigger tail fins, more chrome. Yeah, and here was a product manager for a major company, and he understood it. He understood that they weren't really giving us any exciting new technology. They were just gilding the lily a little bit to make us, you know, part with our right. money. And, and that's running out of steam. That's yeah. getting that's getting very stale because they've given us already enough exciting new technology to make us happy. So now let's <laughs> let's switch gears. In that, in that sense, the worst thing in the world for future business is a satisfied customer. <laughs> Well, the TV industry, <laughs> TV sets. Why do you think they came up with 3D TV? Which sell is, us a new TV because we don't need to buy new ones. Which is indeed is going. <laughs> well, now the new thing is going to be 4K. Yeah, yeah. now they're 4K now TV. they're trying to push the 4K right. for the same reason. Which I think has more validity than 3D ever did, because high resolution is always bigger is better. Godzilla yeah. was right. Yeah. Okay, let's switch gears. Final topic: um, inkjet prints. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of a stagnating technology, yeah, there has not been a significant and we've improvement. We've talked about that before too. Yes, we have. It's been about four years, three to four years now, that Epson, who is the market leader, uh, has not really introduced anything new in terms of heads, inks. Any kind well, they've of ex they've expanded the ink set. The gamut. The gamut yeah, is, is is nicer. Yeah. And I think that's I'm a saying, real I'm issue. Saying just to be fair, though, you know, they, uh, they've, they've expanded the. Why color do we have set. to be fair? <laughs> I try to be. Okay. We then, should be. We should be fair. Then I can get away with so they, much the rest of the time, you know. No, but when the yeah. HDR ink set, that's yeah. at least three years old. That's true. That's okay. true. Time so I, I retract my four-year number. I'll reduce it to three. And, I and I'll say there has been no improvement in the last three years in uh, the inks or the heads. Uh, and the papers are kind of stagnated uh, as well. And I guess I'm asking you, because you happen to be sitting next to me and you're Dr. Science when it comes to this stuff, um, have we actually reached a plateau. Is it a question of good enough 
or do you think it's a question that uh, the technology has peaked? And may, is, do you think there might be another technology that has any potential promise? I don't think the technology is inherently peaked. I think it is getting to a point of diminishing returns. Some of it does appear to be engineering. Back when I was doing the quality control experiments on the 3880 or earlier this year, uh, I mentioned to my contact at Epson, who said, well, you know, you really need a 4900. And I said, yeah, I've looked at the prints, and boy, I really like it. It just won't fit in my office, so I'll have to wait for the 3900. And he said, well, there's a problem with that. The, simply, the head assemblies, the mechanisms are so large to do that, that fitting it into your what do they call them, prosumer? Yeah. Or, or as a friend of mine put it, the opposite of that is confessional. <laughs> you, know, you know, putting it into your confessional printer is genuinely hard. Right. You know, so that's kind of maxed out. But in terms of laying ink on paper, we know we can do better. Um, I've seen better done. We haven't maxed out the technology, but we do seem to have plateaued. Honestly, we've plateaued at a higher level than I expected. I was gauging things this is 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, I may be relative newcomer to digital as my sole way of life, but I have been working with electronic and digital printing since 1972, which is possibly one of the reasons I've been so skeptical all along of how fast it was going to move, because it did take a long time. It was a shallow beginning. Shallow beginning, and then finally it started to <laughs> yeah, pick up. Right. Yes, slow breaking. And, but away. now we're... Now we're, we're at this point. Yeah. But... I honestly thought that the typical inkjet printer would plateau at about the level of a chromogenic print, mm -hmm. which really by modern standards is a very crappy looking print. Uh, poor tonal range, poor density range, terrible color rendition. And I thought it would plateau there because honestly, in the analog print era, analog film era, this is what 99.999% of the world needed. If it wasn't, all the labs would have been doing uh, ill for chrome and dye transfer. Chromogenic was good enough for almost everybody's needs. So I figured that's where the market would plateau. No, it kept going. We ended up at a point where it's vastly better than chromogenic ever was. It has not reached the level of dye transfer in terms of exposure range, but the color gamut is magnificent. It's at a much higher level than I expected to get. And now I think we're hitting a kind of a plateau point on what people are demanding. And and it it only it's, took. The, it's the good enough problem again. Now, not good enough for thee and me. I know we can get more density on paper. I'd love to see at least another stop, maybe two stops density available in the prints. I know it's technologically possible. It doesn't mean the engineering is feasible for the amount of money they'd make selling the printers. Um, it, if you look inside one of the modern low-cost printers, it's an amazing bit of technology. They've done things with stamped pieces of metal and cheaply molded pieces of plastic that you almost wouldn't think are possible. But the precision of the heads is something else. But the, all the rest of it has to work with the same precision, or you end up with banding, mm, lines, you true. don't get the ink laying down right. No. The difference is you look inside something like you know, an, uh, a 9800 printer. Look inside one of the truly professional printers, and then look inside even something like the 3800, and just look at the difference in the quality of the machining, where things are stamped instead of cast and milled, and you can see it's a whole different manufacturing technology. It's a mass production technology that works incredibly well. And I think part of the problem is achieving those ultra high levels of quality without just kicking the cost up into a range where none of us would pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my guess, but the real answer is yeah, I, entirely agree it is, has plateaued i keep waiting for the next generation it isn't forthcoming i may have to live with i know it's technically possible i know that there's no theoretical obstacle not even really an engineering obstacle right but there may very well be a manufacturing obstacle good point i certainly think it's not from sales because we got these better printers because it was a horsepower race Mm -hmm. We didn't need the better quality. said chromogenic was good enough. People didn't need the better quality, but it was a selling point. The other thing that's also peaked out is, is, is the print resolution, which is very, very good. But again, that horsepower race has also stopped. Not that we necessarily need 
more droplets per inch, but there are some advantages in rendering to getting even more. Mm -hmm. And that's also kind of plateaued. So, yeah, I think we're just looking at a... At a I wish we could come back and... Problem. problem. I'm guessing. I mean, I'm not, I don't get to go hang out inside the companies. No, of course, none of and, us do. <laughs> well, and if I did, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. That's right. I <laughs> those, wouldn't be able to what, What's the old joke? Those, those that know... Uh, those that don't know speculate. Those that know keep their mouth shut. Yeah. So I'm here. I'm here. I'm kind of drawing on 40 years' experience with designing printers, designing printer technologies, just knowing about the field in general. But really, I have no idea of what the specific problems are with modern inkjet printers. Mm -hmm. I'm just making a guess. I don't even know if I want to call it an educated guess, you know, an educated <laughs> okay. intuition. Okay, there you go. You know, on, on what we've hit. But it isn't, it's not, we have not hit a theoretical limit. Oh, I, I doubt that. No, no. But uh, maybe a practical limit yeah. for the time being. Theoretical comes into it. Cameras are starting to approach that. Cameras, the best cameras are now within two stops of hitting theoretical physical limits where they can't get any better until you can start doing some very clever quantum mechanical tricks. Mm -hmm. you know, now, the other thing is they aren't there yet, but they're almost there, and that's quite remarkable. That's an exciting time to be involved it in is. photography. And uh, there's more to come, but I think the word plateau is an appropriate one. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're at the, uh, the shoulder of the curve. I think the next... And the changes mm -hmm. will become or have become more gradual, more incremental. We're not on that rocket sled that we were on from about uh, 2001 to 2009, 2010. If I were to, yeah, I think if I were to make a guess as to where the next big jump will occur, and I wouldn't say when, it'll be in one of two areas. It'll either be purely computational photography where we start to see cameras that don't even look or act like cameras as we know them. The sort of stuff that Adobe and other people, have been, Stanford's been playing around with, where you're manipulating the light rays. It doesn't even do conventional imaging. And that may be something we'll see within 10 years, where the cameras simply stop looking like we know them. Yeah, Bill Atkinson camera. has talked to me about that. Yeah, and yeah. there's some very interesting science there yeah. to be done. Uh, where essentially it stops becoming geometric optics and starts to become information science. Mm -hmm. It's a very different realm. The other place I see more conventionally is at some point we're going to transition into what I would call pixels as grain air level. Uh, I'm talking about 100 plus megapixel cameras. Anything between 100 and a gigapixel. And at that point you start to treat the pixels as kind of like film grain, but without the noise and stochastic qualities of film grain. And it opens up all sorts of very interesting possibilities in terms of how you, of what the image quality looks like, how you process it, how you deal with it. And again, that looks, I guess, 10 years, because you kind of just have to make the jump. So tell you what. And of course, then everyone will complain that their hard drives aren't big enough again. <laughs> it's been 10 years since our last chat. Not that we don't see, we see each other once a year or so, but on camera, on camera. it's been about 10 years. So we're going to check back Deal. in 2023? We'll check, back, we'll check back in 2023 and we'll see where the technology is. And, we'll, and is. we'll see how dumb we, ne next time we'll, we can review this interview first and see how dumb we sound. <laughs> so, Boy, did they get it wrong, you know. Well, what else is new? Uh, let's now switch gears a little bit. Uh, Chris can set up the camera and let's look at some of your prints. Okay. Sounds Terrific. good. And thank you. In case I don't Thanks. get a chance later, this has been it's so much fun. fun as always. Great. I love it. When we were chatting before and we switched from sitting over there to sitting over here so we could uh, film the prints, uh, I talked about the quarter tones. Mm -hmm. And God, you've done a great job on this. Uh, this is, we've all been in the woods at twilight. <laughs> we know what the color is. Actually, and 2 a.m. We the all night. know <laughs> what it's like in the woods at 2 a.m. <laughs> Whatever, as Whatever. they say. Whatever. Um, this is phenomenal. This is this captures that feeling. I don't think there's anything here above zone four. Uh, it's just it's just totally lovely. Uh, but I see what you mean. There is no detail. 
in, or at least in this low light level. Th there's a very if I little. If shone a, a bright light there, would I see detail? Right there, a little bit. You yeah. can kind of see the hints of it along the edge. Mm -hmm. um, there is some detail in the trunks. Trickle. There's definitely detail in the file, mm -hmm. but some of it I had to simply push to solid black to get that separation. Yeah. You know, I had to get it somewhere. If I held it, it all looked a little murky. So no, that's I, the I, beauty here. Yeah. It doesn't look murky. No. So I intentionally kicked some of it down. And this is a mm -hmm. place, again, where uh, with some future printer with more density range in the shadows, I could take this and move it down even further. And then, indeed, it would be the bright light effect, but you'd still have the feeling it didn't block up. But what I worked here very hard was to make sure that there was some detail in the tree trunk so they didn't just become silhouettes, so that they have some sense of three-dimensionality. So often, uh, twilight shots, night shots, uh, photographers, cinematographers uh, try and make them look like dark daylight. <laughs> you know, that's just wrong, and this is so right. I, I'm really impressed with, uh, with this print. Thank you, thank you. I honestly wasn't sure it was going to work when I, before I printed it. And this, of the group that you showed me, this is one of my favorites. Uh, I just love these tonalities. Uh, the, there's a, a luminescence uh, to them, uh, and then falling off into the not quite black, and then into total black. That j just stunning. And you've kept. You know, and I helped. Just the right detail in the moon. It was one of those, I was there, I had the camera. Well, it wasn't there, it was at home. <laughs> but I happened to look out the window, and there were these lovely thin layer of cumulus clouds, the mm -hmm. kind that don't quite block out the moon. They're translucent. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, I just wonder. So I grabbed my camera and just no tripod, just sat myself on the steps, tried it. You know, in that sense, it's it's a it's a miracle of image stabilization. <laughs> you know, uh, though really you can't photograph something like this at too low a shutter speed because no. the clouds are moving. Absolutely. Uh, several people have asked me, was this uh, an HDR shot? Did you combine several photographs to make this work? And I said, well, I would have loved to, except even in the bra bracketed sequences at high speeds, the clouds have moved between the frames. So I can't really do that. So this is indeed, yeah, it's a single frame. This mm -hmm. is just the range. I was able to capture the range from the clouds to the moon because it was slightly veiled. In fact, I brought the moon up a little bit because it looked a little too dingy. Mm -hmm. But indeed, it has a very lovely, delicate uh, quality uh, to it. Yeah, I'm, I, that to I'm me, very happy with it. It just it strikes a chord with me, and yeah. uh, really a very strong image. Mm -hmm. This is fun because when we were out shooting earlier today, we were photographing some uh, water uh, flowing over the edge of a um, lift lock. And I think you made a comment about how you got some grief uh, on the forums at uh, uh, Mike Johnson's uh, website yeah. about using high sh shutter speeds when shooting water. I, yeah, if people want to Google it, uh, I wrote a column in which I referred to stochastic photography. S T O C H A S T I C, stochastic photography. That was a term my friend DDB, David Dyer Bennett, who was trained as a mathematician, came up with for doing this. And the idea is that when water moves, it moves so fast, you can't actually see what's happening. You have an intuition that there's interesting things going on. Mm -hmm. But it's like the hummingbird wings, it's just too fast. So you go for the highest shutter speed you can. Well, at least a thousandth of a second, and a fifteen hundredth to a two thousandth is better. Mm -hmm. And if you have a camera that does it, you set it on high speed bracket, and mm -hmm. you just fire off twenty frames. Mm -hmm. Just grab them, bang, 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 and then you look at them later. And, and, the, that, and that's the uh, twenty monkeys with, uh, uh, right. with camera syndrome. Well, that, that was the people common people complained the, about. Yeah, <laughs> people complained. They said, "Yes, but you're not really seeing what you're photographing. You're letting the camera do the work. A chimp could do that." Mm -hmm. uh, to which my comment was, fine, you get me the chimp who can divine that there's an interesting photograph there, set up the composition, set up the camera and adjust it for me, and just leave me to push the button, and I'll get that chimp all the bananas it wants for the rest of its life. <laughs> it, it's what? still a matter of deciding what's the overall composition. Well, of course. Like. And the real reason for needing so many frames is that 
the water's constantly moving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the sort of thing where in one frame, the spray might look a little different than the next frame. I, in theory, I could do it just pressing the button once. Yeah. But the nice thing about digital is I'm not wasting the film. I might as well press it 20 times effectively very quickly and then pick out the one where it is indeed just what I want. And what yes, I, I could have done the same thing. I could have made one frame and looked at it. I made another frame and looked at it. <laughs> you, do it you do it later. But the real, the intuition is looking at the water and going, I bet you it's breaking That'll up in make, interesting yeah. and fascinating ways. Exactly. Now, the rule of thumb, of course, for flowing water is eighth of a second, fifteenth of a second. To, so it's not too still, it's not too blurry. And that's a rule of thumb that, like okay. all rules of, rules of thumbs is, you know, kind of works. Uh, but this is, that's brilliant. I love that. And I also like the fact that it's monochromatic, but you kept that touch of color exactly. up there. Exactly. It, it, it is, in fact, not a monochrome, it's not a monochrome photograph. It is very near to monochrome. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot less interesting printed as a black and white photograph. There's, I would imagine, there's, yeah the subtleties of the way it goes from the shadows, it, it, it brings out a texture to mm -hmm. it, the very yeah, subtle Yeah, there are, there are some bluey grays. Exactly, there are here, some yes. bluey grays, and then there are some others which have a little more sun on them, and it makes a difference. Great shot. But anyway, people can Google for the original article just by looking for stochastic photography and, the, or, and my name, and they'll find it pretty quickly. Or we'll get Chris to put a super title. Oh, he can do that. He you can do that. He can Isn't superimpose a URL on Isn't the video. Isn't that I'm magical? It's magical. Yes. Ooh. See, it's right here, right now. Ah, oh, wow. And if I just click on it like this. It goes away. It goes away. OK, next. <laughs> now this. No, really, we weren't drinking. We had nothing to drink. <laughs> Diet Coke and ginger ale. You got it. <laughs> this knocked me out when I saw it. Uh, as I'm sure it did, the bird who flew into the window. Yeah. Knocked him out. Um, and I didn't intend that pun. It just came out. Wow. This is absolutely what we were talking about earlier, the convenience of small cameras. I pretty much always have my Olympus with me. And this was coming out of a restaurant in St. Paul, walking across one of the skyways there to the parking lot, again with my friend David Dyer Bennett, and we're walking along and I happen to look up and the sunlight is hitting the window and it hasn't been washed recently, it hasn't rained recently, and there are these ghostly bird imprints on it. And it's what happens when a bird hits the glass. Very sad for the bird. Very sad for the bird. But, you know, but what, I what, what, at this, what, a, what a unique image. I look at this and I think to myself, I've got a camera, I have to see what'll happen. And tried a few. This is the one I liked the best of several. I actually had several others that I thought were portfolio worthy and it's such a singular image I didn't want to dilute the effect mm -hmm. by adding them to my portfolio. This is a case where one is enough yeah. because it's I think it's one of the best photographs I've made and it's so many layers. It's beautiful and it's mm. ethereal and it's really disturbing and it's really sad and it does all of this at the same time and part of what makes it work is the detail you see when you get into it. You've not only got each of the feathers, you can see the individual barbs on the feathers in the dust when you look closely. It, it's a picture you can fall into. It wasn't one I was sure would print at all. Mm -hmm. No, I can see why. Uh, you remember what we discussed about tones tending to go a little flat in inkjet prints and it being hard to bring them back. And this is one where I could see in the original scene it looked just fine, and even on the screen. But this all depends on very subtle and delicate tones and textures. And I was quite afraid when I printed it, it would just go sufficiently flat. This would all become sort of uniform brown mm -hmm. effect, that it would lose it. And to my surprise, it was exactly the opposite. The file that looked good on the screen after David and I had played with it printed out I made no adjustments. I just printed out, and the print looked exactly right. And one of those rare miracles, you know, when you don't end up sweating over a print. It, you know, a photograph that meant to be printed, and right now it's one of the ones I'm happiest with. I'm going to be very curious to see if I ever sell any prints of it. <laughs> Seriously, it's a really disturbing photo. It's, dis it's disturbing. Yeah, yeah it's a it, very it isn't disturbing a pretty, photo. It isn't a pretty photograph. No, it's, it's, it, it isn't a graphic photograph. It isn't a colorful photograph. 
but the subject matter it's a profound one it's evocative but, but how much how many of us want to be evoked and profounded <laughs> when we're looking at the wall i don't know if i would but again it's you know if, I, if there's ever a list of you know katine's top whatever many photographs this will be on the list yeah Congratulations. and and it's a case of having the camera with me always there you know Olympus OMD and the wonderful 45 millimeter <laughs> lens and my favorite lens in the world. Great shot. Thank you. Thank you.